Hey guys, I just sent out a, uh, an announcement this morning that has your take home for this exam. Um, it's a lot like the problem that we worked before. You have an elastic collision, so both momentum and energy are conserved. I give you their masses and their initial velocities. Uh, you'll find that, they're, that the solutions are nice, easy answers, too. They're nice, even answers. They're not decimal values. And in fact, you know, if you just Google uh, elastic collision calculator or something like that, you'll find where people have, well, I guess the first one, but there are lots of different things where people, have, they've created these scripts that solve the system of equations for you. They solve it, by the way, using that Gaussian elimination that we did before, uh, back for your 2D, two-body problems. And just let me remind you that you can ex get extra credit on the test, uh, five points if you solve it by that method. Solve the system of equations for the two-body, 2D problem. Not for this, but for the one that you do on the test. Um, so anyway, you go to this calculator, and you can just put in the masses and the initial velocities, and it'll give you the final velocity. So I'm not really looking for the answers. I mean, I expect you to have the right answers because you can just check your answers here. But I'll be looking for your work that you solve it by substitution properly, that you substitute the one equation into the other and do that correctly. I really intend it to be an easy 10 points for you. But if you have trouble with that solving by substitution, then come see me. I can help you. Okay? But I expect it to be everybody just hand it in, and as I look at it, I say, oh, that's perfect, that's perfect, and then everybody gets 10 points off of it. That's really what I want to happen. Okay? If you feel like you're not going to be able to do that, then please come see me. I can sort of help you with the algebra. I'm not going to help you with this problem in particular, but I can help you with that method of solving by substitution. Okay? That's good news for y'all, because that's, that's 10 points that you can walk into the test with those 10 points already in hand. Um, today we're going to begin Chapter 7, but Chapter 7 will not be on the exam on but we're going to go ahead and start it today, and then on Monday, we'll just review for the exam. But remember, if you're studying over the weekend, the exam covers, first, you're going to have a 2D, two-body problem. That means that the forces, at least one of the forces, will be off axis. It might be an inclined plane, or it might be one of the other type of 2D, two-body problems, like the one with the two boxes and the ropes that come in. You have some homework problems, hey Tyler. You have some homework problems that are similar. Look back at the old test. Every test that I have, most of the tests have a 2D and or a two-body problem. Make sure you can set up your vector diagrams properly. Write your equations properly. If you get to that far, that's most of the credit. And then being able to solve those equations. If you solve them by the Gaussian method, then you'll get five points extra credit. And then also chapters five. Chapter five included, what was that? Energy, work and energy. You're going to have to do a dot product. Work is force. F dot D, you're going to have to do an integral, likely, a force that is positional dependent, like a spring, for example. The force depends upon the displacement. And so to figure out the work, you have to do the summation, which is just an integral, over those positions. Uh, and then also you'll have momentum. Uh, you'll have collisions. Uh, Newton's second law, that's that F equals delta P over delta T. Okay. Y'all clear on what to do for the exam on Wednesday? What what to prepare for? All right, and we're going to begin Chapter 6 today, or Chapter 7, rather. Oh, I do want you to turn in that take-home. I said this in the announcement. I want you to turn in at the beginning of the exam. That way I can grade them as they come in, as y'all are taking the exam. But please do it perfectly, okay? I want to see all the work, and I want to see it. I want to see the right answers. I want to see everything done correctly. Everybody should turn in the same paper, right? It should say basically the same thing, so it's really easy grading. I can easily say perfect, 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 perfect. Okay, perfect. Yes, perfect exam. Much higher bar for take homes. Not very little partial credit I'm going to give. Okay, um, let's look at rotation. Now, in the chapter 7 and 8, we're going to revisit everything that we've done up till this point. So we're going to revisit kinematics in this chapter. We're going to revisit uh, uh, forces and Newton's second law. We're going to revisit energy and momentum. All that business we're going to revisit, except now instead of having something move in a straight line or in two dimensions, we're going to have something that's moving in a circle, something that's rotating. And you'll find that... Uh, 
that the questions that we'll encounter aren't quite as complicated as what we had, say, for example, in Chapter 4, but they're going to be a little bit different. And if you had trouble in those earlier chapters, then now's a good time for you to, to maybe flip back and review some of those chapters and see how this chapter and Chapter 8 are similar. Chapter 9 also will be uh, a sort of a revisitation of Chapter 4, which Chapter 9 is purely a take-home. Okay? All right, so let's look at uh, Chapter 7. This chapter is fairly short. We'll probably get pretty far in it today, actually. Uh, we're going to talk about rigid bodies. And it, a rigid body is defined as all parts moving at the same um, angular speed. So if I have a disk, for example, that is rotating about this point, every point on that disk, if it's a rigid body, are going to rotate at the same speed. So it's rotating at some speed. Say we'll measure that speed in revolutions per second. Let's say that it's rotating at three revolutions per second. So for every second, it goes around three times. Every point on this disk, this point rotates at three revolutions per second. This point also rotates at three revolutions per second. And this point, every point on that disk rotates at three revolutions per second. Because it's a rigid body, and those points don't move with respect to one another. So the other uh, criterion is that the parts do not move with respect to one another. WRT, that means with respect to one another. That just means that the distance between any two points is fixed. So if we call this distance D, that means that distance doesn't change. It's a rigid body, right? If I have two points on a rigid body, that distance between those two points, it doesn't change if it's a solid, basically. So your body can be a rigid body. Say if you spin around, I have every point on my body, whether it's the tip of my fingers all the way down into my chest, every point is rotating at the same speed because it's a rigid body. Um, so some examples of a rigid body, I don't know, a spinning disc, a rod, a person can be a rigid body but not necessarily. So for example, a person, if they move their limbs a lot, that's not a rigid body. We'll talk about that later in chapter 8. Uh, what's an example of a non-rigid body? What is a type of object in which the distance between two points on that object are is not fixed? What type of material is that? Okay, yeah, a spring. Yeah, a spring. That's not what I was going for, but yeah. What else? Well, these are solids, right? Rigid bodies are solids. So non-rigid bodies include what? Okay, <laughs> bungee cord. Thank you, Nicole. That's all right. You're right, Tyler. A bungee cord, too. But I was really looking for liquids and gases. So anything that stretches, y'all are both right, a spring is a non-rigid body, and that'll, that'll change. This distance will change. But a non-rigid body also includes liquids and gases. So fluids are non-rigid bodies. Or, as you guys said, a spring is also a non-rigid body because that distance will change. Uh, the axis of rotation is the axis about which an object rotates. So like I have this object, it can rotate about many different axes. It can rotate like this, or it can rotate like this, or it can rotate uh, like this. So it basically has three principal axes of rotation. The same body can have different axes of rotation. And we'll actually see that the rotation about those different axes is very, very different. So for example, you know, I can rotate along this axis if I have an axis going down through the center of my head. And what would that look like? It's right, spinning, right? Like a ballerina. Did I look like a ballerina just then? Did I? Seriously? Good. I can also spin about different axes. I can spin about this axis. What would this look like? A cartwheel. Y'all ready to see it? Yeah. 
No. I can also spin about this axis, like a, uh, a forward flip. And all of those things are very different. We'll see that in Chapter 8. The reason they're very different is because we have different moments of inertia. Uh, we'll, saw, we'll derive those moments of inertia that your body or any object, if it spins about different axes, will spin differently. All right, so I want to go through and just define a few things. We did this in Chapter 2 when we defined displacement, velocity, and acceleration. We're going to see exactly the same here. Uh, first, our angular position. Uh, angular position defines a point in space. You can sort of think of this as the polar coordinates. Remember polar coordinates? I mentioned this back in Chapter 1, and I said we're not going to see that for a while, and we're not going to use it that much. Uh, but remember, with polar coordinates, we use two quantities, r and theta, to define a point in space. And so if I have this point in space, it has an r and it has a theta. Here we're only concerned with our theta as defining a, an angular velocity. So our angular position doesn't describe a point in space so much as it describes uh, a, pres a certain angle that you've moved through. So if I have some object that moves through this angle, then that is my angular position. At this point, my angular position is theta. Uh, it's a similar way that we think about theta otherwise, like in, in mathematics, are thinking about our unit circle. And by the way, your unit circle will be useful to know. So let me just remind you what our unit circle is. It starts at zero. It goes to 90 degrees in this direction, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and then back to 360 degrees. So zero and 360 are the same. And then also it would be useful to know this in radians. So I know that y'all know this, but just to r remind you, I go from zero to pi o pi what? Oh yeah, pi over two is 90, and then I have a uh, pi three pi over two and then 2 pi over here. So this is in radians. And then we can also go through revolutions uh, where I go one full revolution is 360 degrees. So if you don't know your unit circle, I know that m many of you do, but if you don't, make sure that you review that. And it will help you to know, just sort of have that idea of what the unit circle is. Okay. Uh, the SI unit for the angle theta is radians. And we'll use other units. In fact, part of this exam, you'll, you'll need to, not the third exam, but the fourth exam, is you'll need to be able to convert between these different ones. You'll probably just have it as a multiple choice. But uh, other units include revolutions and degrees. Wait, let's go back just a second. So I don't think I had this elsewhere. Um, so don't forget that one revolution, or let me remind you, that one revolution is equal to 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. So if I want to convert revolutions to radians or degrees to radians, then I would say, for example, let's say I have two revolutions. I want to convert that into radians. I would have my unit conversion factor, one revolution, two pi radians. The revs would cancel, and that would leave me with four pi radians. Okay? I also want to just point out here, this is just an aside, but this is the equation for arc. We'll see this again in just a little bit. But notice what happens when theta goes to the full circle when theta goes around all the way, what does this expression become? S equals R theta. If I let theta go the full circle, what does the expression become? The circumference, that's right. So if theta goes all the way around, theta measured in radians is 2 pi. This becomes 2 pi R, which is the circumference. Yes? Remember this geometry? Okay, we'll see that again in just a few minutes. Okay, um, so that's angular position. We define angular displacement. We're going to call it theta. It's equal to theta final minus theta initial. Hey, Ashley. 
Now, we're sort of dealing with things with that we've seen here before, but we wrote them a little bit differently. So if you remember before, our position, we called X, or we called it Y. And our displacement, we called X final minus X initial. And notice really all we're doing here is just replacing our X with theta. And our same definitions will apply. There is one little change is that counterclockwise displacement I remember, so with x displacement, we said if it was to the left, it's negative. If it's to the right, it's positive. We have a similar thing, though we'll see that the directions are a little bit hinky. But we have a similar thing here where counterclockwise displacement is, what do you think it is? Is it negative or positive counterclockwise? It's positive, right? Think about your unit circle. Your unit circle goes clockwise or counterclockwise? It goes counterclockwise. So counterclockwise displacement is positive. Clockwise displacement is negative. I'm not sure why that is, but I always remember because clocks then go in the negative direction. In fact, you can purchase these clocks uh, in these like dorky science catalogs where you can buy like t-shirts with F equals MA and I don't know, Einstein wigs and just sort of kitschy science stuff. You can purchase clocks that go not in the negative direction like this one, because this clock's always going the wrong direction, but you can purchase them where they go in the counter counterclockwise direction uh, instead of the clockwise direction. So you didn't know that, did you? Did you some of you knew that because you're in my lab, but did y'all did you know that? Did she tell you this in your lab? You just didn't write it back. Okay. All right. Uh, if that helps you remember, but also just remember your unit circle goes in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, angular velocity. Remember before we had V was delta X over delta T. We have a similar thing with angular velocity. We're going to define two things. Uh, we're going to define the average angular velocity. First of all, this is a Greek letter. This is the Greek letter omega. I know it looks like a W, but it's not a W. It's sort of more curly than a W. A W has straight lines, and this has it's sort of like two U's stuck together. It's lowercase omega. And omega average is delta theta over delta T. It's the same as what we had for V average. And then also the instantaneous angular velocity. Remember, if we have... Uh, theta versus t, and it looks like this. I can find the average velocity between any two points by finding the slope of that line between the two points. The average velocity disregards anything that happens in between those two points. I just say the final position minus the initial position divided by the time. That's useful sometimes, but sometimes you really want to know the velocity at a particular instant. And so what we do is, at that instant in time, we let delta t get really, really small. And then we collapse it down to that particular instant. And that tool we call the what? The mathematical tool is the derivative, right? And that's why the derivative is so powerful, because it allows us to take this delta t and collapse it down to zero, or let it approach zero. It's a limit. So the instantaneous velocity is the limit as delta t approaches zero of my average velocity, which is delta theta over delta t. And then you all know that definition as d theta dt. So my instantaneous velocity is the derivative of, the fun of theta as a function of time. So just like in chapter 2, you might again see a function for theta, and you have to figure out what is the velocity again. Y'all remember what we did? Like, for example, if I gave you a function, I don't know, theta equals 4t plus 6t squared, then you could figure out omega would be, well, what would omega be? What's the derivative of that function? 4 plus what? Plus 12t. Right, so if you, if you sort of forget how that works, go back and check on chapter 2. We'll see some example problems too, though. Okay? All right, uh, 
just like before, angular velocity is clockwise, that's negative, counterclockwise is positive. You all with me so far? I'm sort of making definitions right now. Um, and it's a lot like what we did in chapter two. You're going to find that it's almost identical. Now, finally, angular acceleration. We can make the same argument with angular acceleration. Uh, here, we're going to use the Greek letter alpha. So, just to remind you, we had x became theta, v becomes omega. And now A will become alpha. So we're going to define this first an average is equal to delta omega over delta T. So just like we did before, if I were to plot omega versus time, it looks like a function like that. The average takes two points and finds the slope between them. Just like before, except now instead of talking about the rate of change of position, we're talking about the rate of change of velocity, or the angular velocity in particular. And then similarly, we can look at the instantaneous acceleration, which is usually what we want to know. And that is uh, the limit as delta t approaches zero. Remember, we can collapse this function down to a particular point, right? we take the derivative, we evaluate it at a particular point, and we find the slope at a particular point. Uh, delta omega over delta t, and that's equal to v omega dt. If it's clockwise, it's what? It's negative. If it's counterclockwise, it's positive. Okay. We're going to see as we go along, we'll find that all of the quantities that we had in chapters two through what six or whatever that we're going to have new variables for those, and so we're going to repeat all of our equations. Those are on your equation sheet that you'll have for the exams, exams three, four, and the final. Uh, so you'll just need to understand or need to remember how these things are translated into these new Greek characters into the theta, omega, and alpha. And once you get your head wrapped around that, uh, a lot of it is fairly straightforward. Some of it's not straightforward, and we'll spend a lot of time on that in class. Okay? All right. Let's um, throw one little kink in, and that is the direction of angular vectors. I'm just going to sort of introduce it right now. It's not going to impact much that you do right now in this chapter, but we'll see the right-hand rule again soon. Um, the direction, if you think about an object that's spinning, like let's say I have this object and it's spinning in this direction. Then it has a certain v at this point. It has a certain velocity vector at this point. Like this point is traveling at so many meters per second as it travels in this direction. But if I go around a little ways, now the velocity vector is going in that direction. And it changes, actually, all the way around. That the velocity vector, as I go around, will change direction as this thing spins around. So it doesn't really make sense to give any one of these directions as the direction of the angular velocity. And so instead, we're going to use uh, something called the right-hand rule. And it'll help us to define what is the direction of the angular velocity. It's going to be a little bit counterintuitive, but I just want to sort of throw it out there right now. We'll see more what the right-hand rule is used for in the second semester when we get into magnetic fields. So I just want to sort of throw this out right now. In order to find the direction, if I have this thing spinning around in a counterclockwise direction, to find the direction, I let my fingers wrap around in the direction of the angular velocity, and then my thumb gives the direction of the... Uh, the angular velocity vector. So in this case, the angular velocity vector, omega, is out of the page. It's in the plus z direction. Right? So we let the fingers wrap in the direction of rotation, and the thumb 
gives the direction of the vector. Be very careful that you use your right hand when you do this. Never use your left hand. And in fact, if you uh, if you Google this, sometimes you'll find people that do a left hand rule, and sometimes you find people that do a right hand rule. Uh, be careful because there are different variations of it, and the stick to this. I'm going to tell you the direction. But again, this isn't going to come up for a bit. We'll see it again in chapter eight. But for now, you don't need to worry about. It. I'm just sort of throwing it out there so we'll say we can look back and remember next semester and in chapter 8. In fact, we're going to see a slightly different variation of the right-hand rule. Uh, let me show you the symbols that we use. These will come up again later, but I'll go ahead and throw them out to you right now. If I have something in the plus Z direction, this is our XY coordinate system. X, Y. My Z coordinate looks like this. This is plus Z. This is minus Z. I'm sorry, that's a Z. I always draw a, a line in the middle of my Z to distinguish it from my 2. So that's my Z. Welcome. Introduce y'all. You see my Z? Say, hey, how you doing, Z? Or not. Okay, anyway, that's how I draw my Z. Uh, so if I have a vector that's in the plus Z direction, I'm going to use a symbol that looks like this. Or sometimes I might use a symbol that's just a dot. In the negative z direction, I use a symbol, well, first of all, the plus z direction. This is supposed to look like an arrow that's coming towards you. I think I've shown you all this, haven't I? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe chapter one or two. But this is supposed to be an arrow that's coming towards you. You ever had an arrow that comes straight towards your head? It would look like this. It's just the tip of the arrow that comes towards you. And then if it's going away from you, you don't see the tip. What do you see? If an arrow, you shoot an arrow away from you, what do you see going away from you? The tail, the fleshing, those two cross feathers. So the symbol that we have for the negative Z direction is like that. We'll use those symbols a lot in the next chapter and next semester. But that's standard notation for plus or minus Z. Okay, so let's write our equations for our linear and our angular quantities. Uh, linear, we had x or y is equal to x naught plus z naught t plus one half a t squared. And then we also had um, z equals z naught plus a t. Don't need to worry about the derivations for these, but remember we did derive them last time. Uh, we derived this one, and then we took the derivative of this in order to derive this equation. Okay, so don't need to worry about the derivations for this this chapter. Now our angular quantities. Remember, x becomes theta, z becomes omega, and a becomes alpha where if it's clockwise, it's negative. If it's counterclockwise, it's positive. No need to remember that, and we'll see some questions like this, that you keep your positive and negative values for these things, if they're clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay. So our new equations then are theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared and omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. All right. So for example, if I'm working a problem and it says that it's in the clockwise direction, the angular velocity, then I'll use a negative value for that. This doesn't denote direction. It's more uh, an indication of is it slowing down or speeding up. So we'll talk about it sort of in terms of direction, but it's not really the direction of the vector. Is this somewhat familiar to y'all? It needs to be a little bit familiar, but it's been a while since we did Chapter 2, so if it's not, that's okay. But you'll want to jump in and, and start working out some of these problems. You can work some of them. Well, you could probably start on today, maybe spend a half an hour working through some of these kinematics problems. Sometimes you'll want to translate the linear equations into their angular quantities. So we have, right, uh, S, Z, and 
A, and these are going to be related to theta, omega, and alpha. Here, if you want instead, you could use x, but I'm going to use s because really it's for the arc, which is s then is the common variable that we use for arc. We can do this. What is the equation for arc? S is equal to what? That is, if I have a certain angle of a circle like this, S is this distance from here to here. What is that quantity for S? We saw it before, but do you all It's R times theta. So S is equal to R times theta. And then as you can probably imagine, V and A are similar things. R times omega, R times alpha. If you look at their units, if you forget, you can look at their units. So for example, let's look at these units. R is in meters, and alpha is in radians per second squared. Radians isn't really a true unit, so I just sort of leave it off there. And when instead we could call it just 1 over second squared. And this has uh, meters per second squared. I don't know why radians isn't considered a unit. Anybody know? Have I ever heard an explanation of that? It is not really considered a true unit, like meters or seconds, or it's not really a physical quantity. Um, so this is the unit for acceleration right here. You might know something else I wanted to say. Oh, okay. oh yes. So one other thing is that these quantities must be in radians. In order for these to work. Because if you do them in degrees or revolutions, that's not the proper SI unit, and so it, it's just it's not going to work out. In fact, we're going to have some problems. Some of them will give you the angles in degrees or revolutions, and some of them will give them to you in radians. You'll never go wrong when you convert everything to radians. Now, sometimes it's just not really necessary to convert them to radians, and I'll show you where that is. But if you're ever uncertain, you should always convert your units to SI units. Okay? Sometimes it's an unnecessary step, but you'll never go wrong converting them to radians. Let's see. Maybe a few questions here. Oh, I'm sorry. That was right there. So by the radius of the motion. Let's try this uh, quick test. By the way, guys, before you start this, uh, just... Be aware that today is drop day, so uh, if you have questions about, about whether or not you should drop the class, then please come see me. I can help paint a picture of sort of what it's like. Now, most of you, like you said, might think it's bad, and it's really not that bad. I've had several students come see me, and they come and thinking they need to drop the class, and then they walk away and find that, hey, I can get a C out of this class pretty easily. So if you think, if you think the situation is dire, then please come see me, because it's probably not quite as bad as you think. We still have a lot left to do. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities for the exams and the final, and we also have these extra credit opportunities. So anyway, my point is just come see me if you're thinking about dropping today. Okay? And one other point, I'll send an email announcement about this later, but we are starting the food drive. And so we'll have a certain quantity. I'm recommending that each student bring three to five items. If you want to bring more, that's fine. If you want to bring nothing at all, hey, that's okay, too. Uh, but generally, everybody participates, just bringing three to five items. And that can start on Monday. Uh, please don't bring water, bottled water. The food banks don't really need bottled water except for limited things like babies for making formula and what have you. But last year, they just got sort of inundated with a bunch of water. So please don't bring water. And it doesn't have to be food. It can be other high items like hygiene items, toothpaste, toothbrushes, stuff like that folks can't buy with food stamps. So it helps them out a lot if they have toothpaste and, you know, I don't know, hygiene type items, soap, stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of people in La Fouche Parish and Terrebonne and St. Mary that are without food. A lot of children, a lot of elderly folks, just a lot of people that need help. And you know what? We all need help sometimes. So 
it's good for Nichols and you guys, which I know that you might not feel privileged, but the very fact that you're here does mean that you have some level of privilege, that you know you have the wherewithal and the resources to come here. So it's good to be able to help others that aren't at the same level of privilege as us, or don't have the same resources that we have. Okay, so I think it's a worthwhile thing. I don't usually give extra credit for things that aren't related to the class, but I think this is a good thing, and I'd like for us to participate. Is that clear? You're not required to participate, but I recommend three to five items. We'll have a certain level. Let's see, out of 140 of students, so probably I'll say if we get to, say, 600 items, which are lots to figure out exactly, if we get to 600 items, then everybody in the class gets 10 points added on to their exam. All right? Is that clear? Okay. I, I have no doubt that we'll get to that. I'm fairly certain that we will. We'll probably exceed that. Okay, so let's try this question. If you're looking at this and you have no idea what to do, just start writing down what you know about the problem. And then write down what you need to know. And then think about the equations that we know to be true and what you can use in order to solve this problem. This is a one-step problem, but you, you might have like two-step problems on your exam. Let's stop at uh, 135, I think. I'll say something else. You want to stop at one 135? I guess if you're not sure. Just when I was reading this article about physics exams, and they said that often students, especially on multiple choice exams, that they just don't write anything. And then uh, they, when they don't write anything, they, they don't do very well in the exam. When I look at a problem like this, I don't, if I look at it just straight up, I don't really know what to do in the beginning. So I always have to put my pen to the paper and just start writing down things that I know about the situation. Maybe draw a picture or just write down the variables that I know. And I recommend the same for you, though. If you look at it and you don't know what to do, just start writing down things. So here, I see that it starts from rest. And it moves through 3.2 revolutions. And then I ask myself, what is that quantity? What variable is that? Well, it's measuring revolutions, so that must mean a displacement. So that's theta is 3.2 revolutions. I write down the units, particularly important here, because notice that my answer is in a different unit in radians. It goes through in a time of 2 seconds. So that's t equals 2.0 seconds. Now I want to know its angular acceleration. That is alpha is equal to what? So I want to know the angular acceleration. And then also, I circled this, but if it starts at rest, that tells me which quantity. If it's starting at rest, what variable does that tell me? Uh, not eta, it's uh, omega, omega initial. Yeah, it's our initial speed or velocity. So it starts from rest, so that means that omega naught is equal to zero. Listen, you don't really need to know what these variables refer to, so you might want to make a little index card with the new equations for kinematics. They're on your equation sheet, but just the new equations are just to remind yourself that theta is displacement or position, omega is velocity, and alpha is acceleration. Just knowing those things will really help you on the exam because you'll be able to give the proper variable name to the quantity. All right, I had two equations. I had omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. 
in this one, I don't know omega, and I don't know alpha, so that doesn't help with a whole lot. And then I have this other one, theta is omega naught c plus one half alpha t squared. In this one, I don't know alpha, and that's all that I don't know. Omega naught is zero, so I have uh, theta equals one half alpha t squared. I'm going to go and convert this to radians. That might have been what some of you did on this when you get it wrong. Uh, 3.2 revolutions. times 1 revolution, 2 pi radians, that is, what, 6.4 pi. I convert that to 6.4 pi, I get 6.4 pi equals 1 half of alpha times t squared. I solve for alpha, 3.2 pi. Want to review that right? Double check here. So theta is 6.4 pi. T is 2 seconds squared. 6.4 divided by 2. Yeah, 3.2 pi. So what's the right answer then? 3.2 pi? It's, it's going to be B. Yeah. Why'd y'all pick A? You put A. Do you know what your mistake is for A? Oh, he's <laughs> oh, I see. You just multiply these two numbers. Okay. Yeah. All right, folks, you're going to need a little practice on this. Uh, there's some homework questions, but you will have on exam four, not on Wednesday's exam, but on exam four, you'll have uh, you'll have some kinematics questions. They won't be quite as complicated as what we had on the first exam, like nothing like our 2D motion or whatever. But you'll have some that are like this or that might even require a two-step where you have to solve for one variable and then solve for another variable. I did do this right, right? Practice, okay? Do the homework. You need to have a little bit of practice. Uh, let's do just a few clicker questions, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. On Monday, we'll just have a help session. So, I mean, I'll be here while I have class, and I, I recommend that you come. Well, I mean, I never require you to come to class, but I recommend that you come, and we'll go over the two-body 2D two problems. We'll go over chapters 5 and 6 for the exam. Okay. Bonnie and Clyde sit midway between the center and the rim. So Bonnie's out here. Clyde is right here. Uh, it makes one revolution every two seconds. How does Clyde's angular velocity compare to Bonnie's? The same, more, less. Doing well. I'll stop at uh, 45. 45. Okay, good. A is the right. Because it's a rigid body, they all have the same angular velocity. So omega is the same at every point. Now, who has the larger tangential velocity, that's that quantity v, which is measured in meters per second. Not omega, but who has the larger speed? Does Clyde, Bonnie, do they both have the same speed, or is it zero for both of them? Who has the larger speed as they're spinning around? Bonnie's on the outer rim, Clyde's halfway. Remember, speed is distance over time, right? So you want to ask yourself, who's covering the larger distance in a given amount of time? Who has the larger distance over the same amount of time? You just told me that they have the same 
angular velocity. That means that they're both going to do one revolution in the same amount of time. So who's going to have the larger speed? The, the linear velocity, the linear speed. We'll stop at uh, 110. 110. Okay, good. B is right. Bonnie has the larger speed. Y'all been on a merry-go-round? It's a lot harder to hang on if you're on the rim, especially if it's going really fast. But if you stand in the middle, you don't have to hang on to anything. Now, you spin fast in the middle. You spin at the same rate, in fact. But you don't have that linear velocity. You're just sort of standing there spinning straight like this. Oh, here's a good, this is a good middle school joke. Y'all ready? Forgive me if you don't like middle school jokes, but this one's kind of funny. Why did uh, Tigger stick his head in the toilet? He was looking for poo. Okay, the dominant of the truck is set to the linear speed of the truck, but it uses a device that measures the angular speed of the tires. That's how it works, actually. It measures how many times per second does the tire go around, and then it translates that into a linear speed. Uh, but what if you take off your little bitty tire and you put some of those big old honking tires with the fancy wheels and stuff on your, on your truck or your car or whatever? How does that affect the speedometer reading? Does it read a higher speed than the actual speed? lower speed than the actual speed, or does it still read the true linear speed? So your speedometer doesn't know that you put on these big tires. So at what speed does it read compared to the actual speed? All right, let's stop at uh, 105. Five more seconds. Okay, very good. It reads a lower speed. That means the truck's going faster than the what the speedometer says. V is equal to omega R. If I increase R, keeping omega the same, I increase V. And that's what happens when you put these big tires. They they have a bigger radius giving you a bigger speed for the same angular velocity. So you have to change your speedometer. Let's stop at uh, 55. Oh no, let's not stop actually. So how is theta related to t? How is theta related to t? What's our expression between theta and t? Well, our equation, our kinematics equation, says that theta is equal to omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Omega naught though, it begins at rest, so omega naught is zero. So I can just get rid of this term completely. So this is asking then, if it moves through theta in time t, through what angle does it move in time one half t? What angle does it move in time one half t? Only about half of you have the right answer. Y'all ask your neighbor what they put. It's a little better, right direction. I'm going to stop at two minutes, two minutes. Okay, good. B is right. 
uh, many of you had A before because you thought that theta was a linear relationship with C when theta is actually a quadratic relationship. So I have this squared relationship. If I have this, I quarter this. So B is the right answer. And let's do this one too. angular velocity related to time. Let's stop at uh, 50. Okay, good. It's a linear relationship because omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t. Omega naught is zero, so I can just get rid of that. If I have this, I have this as well. Let's make this our last one. The fan blade is slowing down, so it's moving in this direction, but it's slowing down. What does that tell us about the quantities omega and alpha? Is omega positive or negative, and is alpha positive or negative? Now, just like we had in Chapter 2 with our velocity and acceleration, if they're in opposite directions, it's slowing down. If they're in the same direction, it's speeding up. So my two quantities, if they're opposite, it's slowing down, omega and alpha. If they're in the same direction, the same sign, then it's going to be speeding up. All right. Many of you have the right answer. A few of you don't. I'm going to stop at one minute. Feel free to ask your neighbor a few more seconds. Okay, oh, um, so omega is negative because it's going clockwise. Clockwise is negative. And since it's slowing down, that means that alpha is opposite that. So alpha is positive. So B is the right answer here. It was better than that. Y'all had a last-minute flurry, a change of answers. Sorry, I guess you asked the wrong neighbor. But y'all have a great day, okay? I'll see you Monday. We'll review for the test, and then the test will be on Wednesday.